poem I read earlier, Desideratus, was written by Max Ehrman in the 1920s. You may have already known it. It's a famous one. It's been printed on many an inspirational poster. Or even if you didn't know it, maybe parts of it sounded familiar and rang a bell somewhere in your mind. Perhaps especially those final stanzas. You are a child of the universe. No less than the trees and the stars, you have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Desideratus is Latin for things desired. This poem is about things one desires in life, from a meaningful vocation to a sense of belonging. Paul's words at the end of 2 Corinthians read like a miniature Desideratus, much briefer, but a similar theme. Paul is also writing about things desired, things desired for a Christian community, for a congregation. Put things in order, agree, live in peace. These desideratus can be received in many ways. I'm glad to hear, Ruth, that you found them meaningful. I think they can be received as a balm for the soul, as a source of encouragement. But depending on the day, they might also be received as trite nonsense. The universe is unfolding as it should. According to who? <laughs> Agree with one another. Paul, have you ever been in a group of people trying to make a decision about anything? Have you seen the church? Our life experience, and sometimes just the side of bed we got <laughs> up on in the morning, can change our reception of these desired things. Often because we've seen their opposite. We've experienced the undesired things. Paul's words here can come across as Pollyanna because so many of us have been hurt by congregations or hurt by conflict in the church, myself included. I've experienced things in church that have wounded me so deeply, things that made it hard to accept my call to ministry, I'll tell you that much. And many of you here today have been hurt by church maybe by conflict in a congregation, maybe by a pastor, or maybe by other people in the pews. It makes sense then that Paul's words can sound impossible at best, disingenuous at worst. That being said, the modern church didn't invent conflict. You'll be glad to know. If you know the letter from 2 Corinthians, you know it is all about conflict. Paul does not hold back on the church from 2 Corinthians. He has some tough words for that community. The Corinthian congregation is on the verge of fracture. Paul chastises the congregation for their involvement with what he calls super apostles other teachers who rivaled his message and authority, these super apostles have stirred up controversy about who to follow and how to practice. There are clearly questions of leadership, distrust, and wounding within the Corinthian congregation. So, so Paul, he knew conflict. And yet after 13 chapters of tough words, 
and corrective teachings, Paul ends with things desired and with a benediction. The Corinthian congregation who received this letter had a choice. They had to decide how to receive Paul's words. Are they trite nonsense? A neat little bow on a messy present? Or is Paul genuinely trying to do something here in the midst of conflict? I believe it's the latter. First, because I believe Paul genuinely cared about the congregations he helped establish. He didn't want to see them splinter. He loved them, and he cared about the Christian mission. I also believe this because of the way his benediction is formulated. This benediction at the end of 2 Corinthians is different than all the other endings to his letters. So we know that it's intentional. Paul's benediction, if you read his work, is usually just the first part. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. But this time, he goes further. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Why? Why the extended benediction here? Paul invokes the Trinity. Not just Jesus, but God and the Holy Spirit. The triune God, the tripartite divine, a concept that Christendom has wrestled with for centuries and celebrates on this day, Trinity Sunday. Paul invokes the Trinity in part because it reminds us that God is a social being. God is one, but God is not alone, nor is God lonely. There is a community in God's being. And the creation story tells us that we are designed to be the same. If human beings are designed in God's image, that means we're designed to be communal, social, relational. Paul is reminding the Corinthian congregation that they're designed to be in relationship with one another. He's implicitly saying, I know that it is hard, but this is who we're meant to be. We're meant to be together. Paul also invokes the Trinity because it invokes the qualities of God. Grace, love, communion, mutual agreement, peace. These are qualities within the Godhead. And the qualities of the Trinity align with the qualities desired, the desideratus, if you will, of community. Just as the Trinity has grace, community desires grace. Just as the Trinity has mutual agreement, so community desires mutual agreement. Paul reminded the Corinthians and all of those who've come after, all the conflicted, troubled, wrestling congregations after, that we have access to these qualities. We have access to these things desired. We hear this in the prayer that Jesus offers his disciples in John 17. Jesus prays that the disciples will know that just as the parent and the child and the Holy Spirit are with one another and in one another, that so are the disciples invited in. Jesus says, and you can see it here, the glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may become one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may completely become one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. God, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. We are invited into the Trinity. 
So you see, the Corinthian congregation and all of their spiritual descendants, all of us here, our congregation, we are well resourced. We are well resourced because we have access to the Trinity. So Paul speaks from a place of resourcefulness, and in these few verses, he not only invokes the Trinity, but he gives some concrete advice for what to do in conflict. I think this applies to all sorts of conflict, the kind we experience with family and friends and spouses, to the kind that is inevitable in any group of people, including the church. Conflict isn't bad. It's not unnatural. It's normal for any group of people, but there are healthy and unhealthy ways to manage it. Paul gives here five concrete steps, and y'all, I made a PowerPoint because I really want us to get this. <laughs> I want us to understand this because that's part of what we do as church. We have to have hard conversations. And we might disagree sometimes. So let's learn how to deal with it in a healthy way. Are you ready? First, Paul says, rejoice. Now, you might be scanning your text and wondering where he says that. Well, there's a mistranslation. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters and siblings, farewell. And the word that's translated farewell should actually be translated as rejoice. Paul uses it multiple other times in this letter, and every single time it's translated rejoice. That's what he means. So Paul says, finally, rejoice, which can sound so counterintuitive, but it's good advice. Rejoice, have fun, put differences aside for a second, and have a party. We have healthier conflict when we have healthier relationship, and relationship is built on shared experience. So Paul's first piece of advice is rejoice, have fun together, celebrate one another. Because once you know each other better, once you've let your guards down and you've danced and you've eaten and you've hung out at the park, you're going to have healthier conflict. Second, Paul says to put things in order. The Greek here is both passive and reflexive. That means that putting things in order is both something that the community does and something that happens to the community or individual. Another way to put it is restore things. Do the work. Look at your own actions. Self-examine. What role did you play in the conflict? Do the work as a community, restore what needs to be restored, and be open to the way that God is going to restore. God's also in the process. Be open to changing in the way that God would have you change. Third, Paul says, listen to my appeal. This can also be translated as encourage each other. I know that's confusing. That one Greek word can mean both listen to my appeal and encourage one another. But guess what? Both are good pieces of advice. If you're going to have a conflict, you need to listen. You need to listen because everyone has a perspective. And you need to listen with an open heart, active listening, they call it. Not just listening so that you can jump in to give your point of view and encourage each other. We can do that even in the midst of conflict. Have you ever had an argument with a friend, a family member, someone close to you? Maybe then you know what it's like to say, this hurt me, I'm angry, but this relationship, it matters to me, you matter to me. So I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to encourage you. I'm gonna stick in this with you until we figure it out. Four, Paul says to agree with each other. Well, duh, Paul. 
we agreed with one another, we wouldn't be having a conflict in the first place. But to agree is more than just to think the same things or to have the same opinion or even to be free of conflict. Max Ehrman said it well in the poem. He said, as far as possible without surrender, be on good terms with all people. Agreeing doesn't mean surrendering. It doesn't mean laying down all of your beliefs and values and morals. No, as far as possible without surrender, find mutual ground. To agree can also mean to set your mind on shared goals. What's our shared goal? Is it restoring a relationship? Is it better communication? And guess what, church? We have a great set of shared goals. Pastor Veronica revisited them last week, our entire mission statement. If we ever find ourselves in conflict, let's go back to the mission statement. Let's hold that up. This is who we've said we're going to be. We're setting our minds to this. How does this guide our conflict? Finally, Paul says to live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with us. Remember that peace is not surrender or the absence of conflict. It's not saying nice things and then sweeping all the nasty things under the rug. No, deep peace, shalom, it's flourishing for all people. Living in peace, that means in the midst of our conflict, can we pay attention to who gets left out? To whose voice we're not hearing? Can we pay attention to who is impacted the most? Are we paying attention to who's on the margin? That's Paul's advice. Rejoice, put things in order, listen, agree, live in peace. And embody these things. Don't just say them. Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. That was a gesture that embodied respect and care for the other person. So all of these five things, they must be embodied, not just talked about, not just given lip service, embodied. Paul's advice is good. These are things that community desires, and yet, there may still be a part of your heart or mind that says, oh, but that reconciliation, that oneness, that unity, it's impossible. There might be a part of all of us that says, I can't imagine it for this relationship. I can't imagine us having consensus on that. I can't imagine reforming relationship with that person. I can't imagine us having political unity. I'll be honest, I can't imagine that one. I literally can't imagine it. But here is where hope comes in. Because look at what God has done. Look at the resurrection. Look at the Exodus, look at the story of Pentecost, of people suddenly being able to speak in different languages. Look at all the things God has done in our lives that we somehow, quite frankly, despite all odds, remained a congregation throughout the pandemic when we couldn't meet together for over a year. Look what God has done. I couldn't have imagined it, but it happened. That's the spark of hope. And as Paul writes earlier in 2 Corinthians in chapter 3, verse 12, since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. My friends, let's act with great boldness. Let's give ourselves over to a love that dissolves boundaries, the love of the Creator and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are well resourced.